Welcome to my Switching Routing and Wireless Essentials course. This should be the CCNA version 7 curriculum. This is the second of three courses. Welcome to my Switching Routing and Wireless Essentials course. This should be the CCNA version 7 curriculum. This is the second of three courses. Welcome to lesson five, STP concepts. This is spanning tree protocol. So in this lecture, we're gonna be looking at the purpose, the operation and the evolution of spanning tree protocol. One of the fun things is this is actually one of the harder technologies. It's overly simple, but when you first learn it, there's a lot of terminology that we got to get through in order to make this understandable. So that makes this topic a little harder than most of the other topics. So what's the purpose of spanning tree protocol? What's the purpose of STP? So basically, when you have three devices connected to one another, you can have what's called a loop, a uh, physical loop of three devices. The issue is, if one device is forwarding broadcasts, it actually creates this broadcast storm because it will actually start forwarding all these frames out all its interfaces and all of the receiving devices will get them and forward them out and so forth and so forth and so forth. So it actually consumes all of the resources on the different devices eventually. So the goal of STP it's actually to provide redundancy in a layer two network without having a physical loop. STP breaks the loop, logically. Here we have that circle, S1, S2, S3, there is a physical loop. And we have connections between S1 and S2, that's trunk one between S1 and S3 is trunk three, and between S2 and S3 is trunk two. Well, this is a looped environment. So there has to be a way to actually prevent one of these trunks from actually turning on. And that's the goal of STP. It will logically disable an interface to prevent this loop from occurring. If there is a failure, for example, between S1 and S2, then the switches will actually turn back on the link it had previously turned off to provide that alternate path. That's called that STP recalculation. That way, it's not a looped environment anymore and it can disable the link between S2 and S1. So again, having multiple paths is a good thing. However, when there is a loop, that loop can provide instability in the form of wasting resources of the devices. Things like um, forwarding out those frames may cause link satur uh, saturation, may cause the CPU and RAM utilization to go sky high and other resources just to be consumed. In a layer three environment, we have a TTL, a time to live. So each device would actually decrement at one. However, with layer two, there is no mechanism to eliminate our endless loops. So we have to do it at the switch level. So without STP enabled, layer two loops could form. When the loops do form, it would cause instability in the network. A unknown unicast frame could actually accidentally cause a broadcast storm. And again, a broadcast storm is just an abnormal high number of broadcasts that overwhelm a network to the point that all resources are consumed. So a host that is caught in a layer two loop will eventually become unaccessible because again, the devices have limited resources and all of those resources are being used to uh, 
process these broadcasts, it essentially becomes a denial of service attack. STP has what's called a algorithm. That's what calculates the paths. It's called spanning tree algorithm, STA. The STA creates a loop-free topology by electing a single root bridge. A root bridge is basically like the master switch that will allow us to figure out what ports to turn on and what ports to turn off. This master switch, this root bridge, allows us to prevent loops by turning ports into different states depending on how they're operating. So how did STA create a loop-free topology? It creates a root bridge. Basically, this is the reference point that the rest of the network is built off of. It actually will start blocking redundant paths so that there's only one logical path to flow, thus creating a loop-free environment. When the switches detect a failed link, there is a recalculation to verify that paths are still accessible. If a path is not accessible, they may turn on a blocked redundant path, freeing up a logical connection, thus allowing one connection to flow through the network, not creating loops. We do have a packet tracer investigating STP. Again, these are done in other videos. So let's go ahead and talk about operation. When a switch is turned on, STA will start happening. It will elect a root bridge. It will elect root ports. It will elect designated ports. And it will elect a alternate blocking port. During the STA and STP functions, the switches will send BPDUs to share information. Each BPDU will contain a bridge ID. Basically, this is a clever way of identifying what switch is sending data. The bid is involved in making many of the STA decisions, including figuring out which is the root bridge and root ports. The bid will contain information such as priority value, the MAC address of the switch, and if there is an extended system ID or VLANs associated with a particular switch. The lower bid, normally some form of combination of these three fields, will be the root bridge. We're looking for the lower of the information. There is actually a very specific process to electing. It will look at bridge priority. The default value is 32768, and you can modify that. Again, the lower the bridge priority, the more preferred it is. A bridge priority of zero will take precedence over all other bridge IDs. Next will be this extended system ID. Basically, the extended system ID is a value in a decimal form added to the bridge priority value in the bid to identify the VLAN that's associated with the BPDU. So if everything has equal bridge priorities, then it'll look at the extended system ID. If they're all the same, it will look for the lowest MAC address. Whoever has the lowest number will become the root bridge. So the STA will designate a single switch as the root bridge and it will use that as a reference point. In this example, even though the MAC addresses are going to be the lowest on switch 2, it will look at priority first. Priority, extended IDs, then MAC addresses. Here we have a modified priority of 24577. This specifically is the lowest priority, so that means S1 becomes the root bridge. 
because it has the lowest uh, BID. It will then designate ports accordingly. If everything is left default, then it will look at extended IDs and then it will look at MAC addresses. Now we need to look at what the trunks, the links between switches cost, because this will help us determine what the different ports are going to be. So the different costs are going to be based off of the link. If it's a gigabit link, it's going to be a cost of four. If it's a hundred megabit link, it's going to be a cost of 19. This basically just allows us to figure out which paths to take. Example, if we are trying to go from PC1 to PC4, we can see the path costs. We can go switch 2 to switch 1, or we can go switch 2 to switch 3, switch 3 to switch 1. And from there, we can figure out the appropriate costs. Switch 2 to switch 1 is a cost of 19, meaning that's a 100 megabit connection. If we're going to take the other alternate path, switch 2 to switch 3, switch 3 to switch 1, that's going to give us a cost of uh, 38. Because again, there's two links of 100 megabits. So that kind of lets us know which path we should keep up. We should keep the shortest path, which will be the link between switch 2 and switch 1. And we should disable the link between switch 2 and switch 3 the ports going towards the root bridge will be called a root port. So here we have FA01 on switch two and on switch three. As they are going towards the root bridge, that's why they're called root ports. Ports that actually are flowing away from the root bridge will be called designated ports. So on switch one, F0201 and 03, as they're leaving the root bridge, they're all designated ports. The uh, switch three, as it has information leaving it, going away from the root bridge, it will actually classify the link between S3 and S2 as one of them being a designated port. Here it elected F2 on switch 2 to be a designated port. That means the port F02 on switch 3 will actually be called our alternating port. That will be the port that is logically turned off. This will be our backup port. This essentially will disable that link until the root bridge has determined the link between S1 and S2 have been compromised. If link one goes down, it will tell switch three to turn on FA02, thus restoring connectivity questions, concerns, please reach out. Thank you.